Amen. Come on, happy Sunday, Rock Church family. Hey, how many of you are just grateful to Jesus that you get to worship him and work on your summer tan at the same time? All right, why don't you just turn to your neighbor and just say, you're looking good this morning. Way to go. Hey, well, uh, we're in a series uh, called Character in Crisis uh, from First Peter uh, this morning, and we're coming to a uh, challenging passage uh, this morning of 1 Peter chapter 3. If you want to turn there, go to rockofoswell.com slash notes. Um, and uh, it's a challenging passage. It's not really a family service in the sun passage. It's about um, wives and husbands submitting to each other. How many of you, that's just your devotional reading when you wake up in the morning. It's like, man, I just want to learn about submission more today. So that's what we got. But I want to say two things about that uh, before we read it and dive in. Number one, is this, we at the Rock Church, we believe in the whole Bible. How many of you believe in the whole Bible, the whole Bible? We're not going to lay off of anything. But number two, um, is there some challenging parts in this passage that we will not be able to reach today? Uh, Pastor Bob's going to cover all the challenging stuff next week, okay? Um, I'm just going to do the happy things uh, that's hopefully going to encourage. No, I'm just kidding about that. There's all the resources. But I am going to highlight something I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying to us today. So why don't you open up to First Peter uh, chapter 3, and I'm going to pray for us, Lord. We ask for your grace this morning. In a, in a passage uh, that, that might be challenging to some, God, we pray that you would speak with clarity to us and we approach your word with a posture of submission and learning uh, to see what you have to say to us. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen. Hey, I just want to ask this question for those of you who are married, uh, those of you who are married, how many, of you, how many of you would say, you know what, I just have the perfect spouse they're perfect. They're absolutely perfect. Thank you, uh, husbands who are raising your hands. Awesome. How many of you say, you know what? Um, my spouse has some issues. Okay. My spouse has some issues. Okay. We've got some hands up. Um, I just want to generalize this even a little bit. Uh, has anybody ever, uh, just this is kind of a general question, but you've just had a bad attitude before. Anyone ever just had a bad attitude? It's like, man, where did that come from in my heart? I was trying to come up with a uh, sermon illustration for this text this morning. So I asked my wife, I was like, hey, babe, can you think of a time when I've responded with a bad attitude to something? And she just starts listing all these times. So um, I, I don't necessarily want to share any of them, but, but then uh, like, and then in the next day, we couldn't come up with a good one. I was like, babe, have you thought of anything yet? Like, we got to get like this good, funny story. And she's like, you know what? I'm actually really grateful that you asked me this question. And I was like, why? And she was like, well, just says, help me see, you have a bad attitude a lot. Like I'm, as I'm reflecting on our marriage, man, I'm learning a lot about you. But here, here's kind of the point of even why we're in First Peter is, is everyone who's been in any sort of relationship would know whether that's a marriage relationship, a friendship relationship, crises and trials in relationship sometimes can bring out the worst part of us. Are the people who are closest to us uh, oftentimes see the most sinful parts of us. How many of you would say that is true in my life? The people who are closest to us always see the worst parts of us. But crisis in our life reveals, forms, forges our character. We see who we are in hard times. Anyone who's been following Jesus for a long time want to say amen to that. We see who we are in hard times. Character reveals crisis. And so we're in a crisis point for many different reasons at our nation. And I think there's an opportunity for us as the people of God to say, how are we responding to this? Are we responding in faith or in fear? Are we responding in anxiety or in prayer? prayer? How are we responding? So that's why we're reading 1 Peter all through this summer. Is 1 Peter is this letter to the church about who they are in a time of crisis. The people of 1 Peter are going through some challenges. And so Peter writes this letter uh, to say, this is who you are. Are. And so if you even read, how many of you, uh, has anyone taken a moment just to even read First Peter as we've been going along through this? I'm going to encourage you, read it. Um, I love uh, the audio Bible. Has anyone ever used the audio Bible before? Like, man, it's awesome. Like on a drive or on a walk, uh, just to open up to First Peter, press play. Uh, we want to see what the Holy Spirit's speaking to us as a church through this book. But the first part of it, is all about who we are. And then the second part, which we're starting today, First Peter chapter 3, is about how we do it. Everyone say who 
And everyone say, how? And so who we are, the key to understanding 1 Peter is this verse. 1 Peter chapter 2 says, but you are, everyone say, I am. And you don't have to repeat the rest of it unless you really want to. You want to get real Pentecostal today. You could just say the whole thing with me. But you are, I am a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Come on, how many of you have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light? But one of my favorite kind of uh, descriptors of who we are is this word, royal priesthood. Everyone say priests. Uh, We don't talk about that word priests very much. We might think of maybe a Catholic priest, but uh, in in the Bible, there's these priests and there's this temple. uh, And and the temple is the place where God's uh, presence is. It's the place of God's presence and the priests were the people that would wake up early in the morning and make sure that the the animals were able to be sacrificed on the altar. It's this place of uh, submission and sacrifice. And one of the one of my, the best verses to tell us about the job of a priest is Leviticus chapter six, which says, "Do not let the fire on the altar go out." The main job of a priest is to keep the fire of worship burning in the temple. But how many of you know, because we've said yes to Jesus, we don't go to a physical temple, but we are the temple. God's presence is with us. And if we are priests, I want to see if you're paying attention. How many of you are a priest again? I want to see that. Okay. If you are a priest, that means your primary job, our primary job is to keep the fire on the altar burning to keep our hearts alive in love and worship to Jesus. So I want to ask a question this morning is how is your heart? Is it more numb or is your heart staying encouraged in this season, alive in love with Jesus? How are you actually doing? Um, when Morgan and I, when we go, we go see a counselor because we just love it. It's just awesome. Uh, counselors are the best and we all need help. So we go to a counselor and she always asks us, how are you doing? And we're like, well, we're good and this, this, and this. And then she says, how are you really doing? And it's like, oh, well, yeah, all this stuff. So that's my question for you this morning. How are you really doing? And, and when we look uh, and that's, that's our role is to keep our hearts alive and love with Jesus and the spaces where we do that are the church. But Peter gets really specific and, and he do, says this passage and I'm going to read it uh, uh, or just to parts of it here. But I want you to pay attention to specific words um, that you might not have seen in this before. But first Peter chapter three says this, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Will they see their, your respectful and pure conduct? Do not let your adorning, everyone say adorning, be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry. Everyone say gold. Again, pay attention to these words. You might not have ever seen this before. Well, let your adorning, everyone say adorning, Be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty, a gentle, quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Um, And then later in verse 7, it says, Likewise, in the same way, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Everyone say vessel, since they are heirs with the grace of life. So here's what I want you to pay attention to is these words, adorning, gold, jewelry, vessel, These words are the same words that the Bible uses to describe the temple. These words are the same used, the adorning, the beauty that was in the temple, the gourd, the golden ornaments. In fact, that word vessel, and that's a cha- there's different things we could say about that phrase, weaker vessel. But And again, Pastor Bob's covering all the challenges next week. But just vessel is a word to describe the things that were in the temple, these instruments of worship. So when Peter says, you are priests, the place where we work that out is in a big way the church. This is where we keep our hearts in live love with Jesus, but in a very special way, marriage is a space where God's presence dwells. Your marriage is a temple. 
Your marriage is a space for the Holy Spirit, a space where we as priests keep our hearts alive in love for Jesus together. And I want to say, if you are single, how many single people on the lawn tonight? How many of you single people believing for a ring by spring? That's just the prayer on your heart. I want to pray for you after this. But your friendships even, and that's, that's kind of what Peter talks about when he talks about the church, your friendships are the space where we keep our hearts alive in love for Jesus. And that means the primary question of marriage is not, let let me, let me say it this way. So for, for the, in the Roman empire, marriage was all about economics. Okay. The question was, um, actually women were, had kind of a cool role in the Roman empire because business was done out of the house and wives were seen as the kind of the, uh, the, the administrators, like the, the COOs, you guys know what COO is like the chief executive officers of the house. They had a cool responsibility, but that meant that for marriage for a husband was, Hey, who is going to help me economically? It's an economic decision. Um, And I think about that view of marriage, but then I think about the view of marriage today, um, as we see in rom-coms, movies, all these things, uh, which is kind of like the view of marriage is all about who makes me feel the best. Who makes me feel the best? How do I find somebody that's kind of this fairy tale romance and I just feel all the ways at all the right times? And so I'd say for Peter, he's actually redefining marriage. And he's saying, hey, it's not primarily about an economic decision. What's the most strategic thing to do? But he's also not saying the American dream. Hey, it's all about who makes you feel good. The primary question for marriage is who is going to help me love Jesus more? Who is going to help me love Jesus more? And I've got news for you uh, is, is that uh, sometimes, in fact, most of the times, the space where we learn to love Jesus more is in the space of submission and hard things. Why? Because it's in submission and the hard things in life that we die to ourselves a little bit more. We get rid of a little bit more selfishness and learn the selfless love of Jesus. So if your spouse or if you're single, your friends cause you problems, you don't like them very much, good news, it's helping you become more like Jesus because you're learning to lay down preferences, desires, and love. I want to read this quote from Pete Scazzaro, um, and this is really my only thought this morning. I don't have a lot of thoughts about this passage, but this is my only thought. Your marriage is a temple. It's the space where you learn to love Jesus more. So how are you uh, prioritizing prayer in your marriage or if you're single with your friends? How are you creating the spaces uh, to learn to love Jesus more, seeing challenges as an opportunity to grow in love? But Pete Scazzaro says this in The Emotionally Healthy Leader. He says, married couples, once again, where are my married couples at? Bear witness to the depth of Christ's love. Everyone say depth. Their vows focus and limit them to loving one person exclusively, permanently, and intimately. Does that make sense? Married couples demonstrate the depth of Christ's love, the commitment, the sacrifice, the humility. But singles, once again, where are you at singles? There's no other option, right? You're either married or, right? Is there, if there's a third option, you might have to let me know. So singles, vowed or dedicated, meaning you've committed yourself to singleness or you're just single for a season until God brings the right person into your life. Bear witness to the breadth of Christ's love. Everyone say breadth or the width because they're not limited by a vow to one person. They have more freedom and time to express the love of Christ to a broad range of people. Both marrieds and singles point to and reveal Christ's love, but in different ways. Both need to learn from one another. And then my favorite quote, uh, St. Teresa, who is single her whole life. So if you're, I don't know if that encourages the single people, but she committed to it. She was a nun. So, okay. But St. Teresa of Avila said, having good friends is a way to have God himself. The relationships in our life are the place where we experience and learn about God's love. All right, simple thoughts this morning, but hey, it's sunny, and I think we'd much rather go to lunch. Okay, so let me, let's, let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll be done this morning. But Jesus, we love you. God, we ask for grace 
um, in relationships that are hard. I just want to see this just with eyes closed. If you're here this morning and you're saying, you know what, there's a relationship in my life that's particularly challenging right now. It's, it's hard. Again, just eyes closed all over the space. Can you just slip your hand up just real quick? I want to pray for you. God, we pray for grace to love well in those relationships, grace to lay down maybe our own preferences and desires and learn to love in a deeper, richer, fuller way. God, we pray for strength to endure. And I actually want to ask us two questions to respond this morning. Just everybody with your eyes closed, just respond to the Lord. Um, What's one area of challenge in your life right now? I just want to ask that. Just with eyes closed. What's one area of challenge in your life right now? Maybe a challenge in your relationship with your spouse or if you're single, a relationship with your close community. What's one area of challenge right now? One area of hardship, one area where maybe a tension area that keeps just... Uh, You just keep coming back to it. What's what's the challenge right now in either your marriage or in your singleness? All right, has everyone got something? Everyone got something? This is just for you to respond to the Lord. The second question I want to ask is, how can you use that as an opportunity to love Jesus more? How can you learn to use that as an opportunity to grow in humility? How can you use that as an opportunity to grow uh, in love for Jesus? Yeah, but Lord, we give these things to you. We give these challenges. We give the hardships. Lord, I pray for encouragement for every person here that's going through hardship. God, we pray for your grace and your love to fill us. In Jesus' name, everybody said,